This video covers five common questions or objections Christians will likely receive when sharing the gospel with someone who is a Muslim. The gospel message is simply that Jesus Christ died for sins, that he rose and was buried, and that he rose from the grave for our salvation. Within that simple message, already hearing that, Muslims would say, Ah, that can't be because Christ didn't die. Most Muslims that I have met make this objection. It comes from Surah, chapter 4, verses 157 to 158 which read, And for their saying, Indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the Son of Mary, the Messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who defer over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption. And they did not kill him for certain. So right there, you see that they did not kill him for certain. They think they did, but they didn't because someone else was made to resemble Jesus to them. A couple, three options you can give in response to this. First option is that the Quran contradicts itself and actually indicates that Jesus did die. It's around 1930. This is the infant Jesus speaking. Again, infant Jesus speaking as recorded in the Quran. He said, Surely I am a servant of Allah. He has given me the book and made me a prophet, and he has made me blessed wherever I may be, and he has enjoined on me prayer and poor rate so long as I live, and dutiful to my mother, and he has not made me insolent, unblessed. And peace on me on the day I was born, and on the day I die, and on the day I am raised to life. So right there in this passage, you see Jesus prophesying that he will die, and that he will be raised to life. Also, the Quran says, But when thou didst cause me to die, thou wert the watcher over them, and thou art witness of all things. Again, this is the Quran recording the words of Jesus, speaking of Allah being the one that caused him to die, and that Allah watched over him during this, and that he's witness of all things. So the Quran contradicts itself by saying that Jesus did not actually die when it implies through Jesus' own words that he would die and then in fact that Allah watched him die. Uh, so I don't usually like to go this route with them because I don't have these verses memorized. If I share them with them, I don't read the Arabic I can only read the English, so they could always fall back on, well, this is a translation issue. You need to read the Arabic, which is the fully authoritative way of receiving the word of Allah. So I don't usually go this route, but if the book is self-contradictory, uh, we can discount the book as being true and from God. A second option uh, is to refute their arguments about who died. So oftentimes what they'll say is that the person that died would be Simon of Cyrene. This is the guy that carried Jesus' cross. Maybe they say Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Sometimes you'll hear Barabbas was the one who actually was put on the cross. Could it have been someone else from the crowd? I've had one Muslim tell me that it could have been a spirit. So when you go through this, you could ask questions on each one of these. How could Simon of Cyrene have been the one on the cross? He carried the cross, but... Unlike Jesus, he had not yet been flogged. Unlike Jesus, he would have not been stripped of his clothes. People were there who knew Jesus, who, uh, like his mother at his crucifixion, like his apostle John. So others would have, people would have recognized that's not Jesus up there. Uh, there wouldn't have been this switch that would have occurred. I don't think it would have worked. Now again, the verse from the Quran says that someone else was made to resemble them. So if you go through each of these and show how this is just not the case, like Judas Iscariot, how would he have gotten onto the cross? Because the Jews would have definitely known who he was. He was the one who betrayed Jesus. They wouldn't have had him be the one on the cross. So uh, you could just argue these directly and even show that, as Bart Ehrman says, this is the most certain fact of history that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect. It's in the Bible, as well as recorded outside of the Bible uh, by multiple historians of that time who were not Christians. The other option is to actually just go with the Bible and say, well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus Christ died for sins, that he was, in fact, crucified. The objective then uh, would be that the Bible is corrupted, However, the Bible's corrupted is not uh, actually lends itself to 
are benefit speaking with a Muslim when they make this statement because they're setting themselves up for yet uh, another contradiction within the Quran. Uh, within the Quran, it is stated that more than just the Quran has been given by Allah. Muslims believe Allah has revealed his books to various prophets for the guidance of their nations. A verse that supports this, Surah Nisa 163, We have sent the inspiration as we sent it to Noah and the messengers after him. We sent inspiration to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, to Jesus, Job, Jonah, Aaron, and Solomon, and to David we gave the Psalms. And so there are four main books that were revealed by Allah. Uh, the first is the Torah given to Moses, and what Muslims say is that became corrupted, so Allah sent the Psalms to David, and that too became corrupted, so he sent the Gospel to Jesus. That too became corrupted, and thus he sent the Quran to Muhammad. And they say that there are other smaller books uh, which are called scrolls that were received by other prophets. So how could this be corrupted? The argument here is to go to what the Quran itself says. Within the Quran, you see the words of God cannot be changed or corrupted. So you can look those verses up there, and you will see it. Like the first one, Surah 634, says that Allah's words cannot be altered. The Quran says the Bible is the word of God. And there are other places you can look besides just the ones listed there to support this. By looking at what the Quran says about uh, looking to Christians and Jews for answers and help with understanding God's word. Therefore, on the Quran's authority, the Bible could not have, changed, could not have been changed or corrupted as many Muslims claim. So they tell you the Bible is corrupted. You can go through this process with them. You could also just put it more as questions. Well, doesn't the Bible, well, doesn't the Quran say the Bible came from Allah? They would say, yeah, it does. And you go, well, well, wouldn't you then believe it? And they'd say, no, it's been corrupted. And you point out, well, no, no, no. Instead of even quoting the verses that show from the Quran that God's word cannot be changed, you could potentially say, well, ask questions along that line of, well, how is that possible? How can men possibly be strong enough to change and alter God's word? Is he not strong enough to keep his own word? That, I think, is a question they should be able to answer. They should also probably have to be able to answer how they know that the Quran has not been corrupted if the others sent by Allah have been corrupted. But just looking at these verses from the Quran, uh, where it says his word cannot be changed, Muslims then have to look at the claim they're making that the Bible's corrupt. Is it true or is that a false claim? If it's a true claim based on the verses in the Quran, that would mean Allah couldn't protect his word. So he says it's going to be unaltered, but the fact that it has been must mean Allah wasn't able to protect it. Therefore, he must be inept. Either that, Allah wouldn't protect his word, in which case he would be immoral because he says to people in the Quran that they should look at it and accept the Bible. The other option is that the statement that the Bible is corrupt is false, in which case the Bible is not corrupt. So either way Muslims want to go, true or false, they're going to run into problems with what they believe from the Quran. Option two is to just ask a bunch of questions. The burden of proof is on the Muslim because the Muslim is the one making the claim that the Bible is corrupt. It should be up to them to prove that it actually is. So you can ask questions. Well, who corrupted it? When was it corrupted? Which part was corrupted? Where was it corrupted? Why was it corrupted? Muslims do not have good answers to this. They are just taught over and over again that the Bible has been corrupted. They have not investigated this. That's, that's all they have is the claim. What it even makes it eat, like plays into our hand even more is sometimes they will quote certain parts from the Bible and then you can ask them, well, why are you quoting this part but not recognizing the parts where Jesus says he's God or the parts where it says that he actually died for our sins? How are you able to pick and choose which parts were corrupted and which parts weren't? And again, they, they don't have good answers for this stuff. Uh, the best answer I heard was someone say, oh, the apostle Paul corrupted the gospel after the apostles died. And well, that's that's easy to counter because there were apostles that survived after Paul, such as John. He would have been around to correct the uh, gospel accounts if Muhammad, or if uh, the apostle Paul had changed them. 
The third option is the bibliographic test. The bibliographic test asks, has the document successfully come to us? Does it accurately portray the original writing? There are portions of books that date back to the second century uh, with, of the New Testament. So portions of the New Testament date back to the second century. There are over 5,000 Greek manuscript copies. The number is actually a lot higher than that. 5,000 is just a nice easy number to remember. There are some 8,000 manuscripts in the Latin Vulgate. The Bible is the best bibliographical support of all classical writing. So when we actually compare the copies that have remained, uh, there are very, very few differences amongst them. When we look at other people in history, we ask, do they exist? Are their writings reliable? And we say they are. However, very few manuscripts of these ancient writers exist. At best, we have about 20 copies of most ancient manuscripts, and they're far removed from their original date of authorship, yet we still trust them, which leads to this wonderful quote by John Ward Montgomery that says, To be skeptical of the resultant text of the New Testament books is to allow all of classical antiquity to slip into obscurity, for no documents of the ancient period are as well attested in bibliography as the New Testament. third objection that we'll oftentimes hear is that the Trinity is three gods, not one. To respond to this, usually the best thing to do is to uh, define the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, we say there is one God, and God exists in three persons. We need to explain this Trinity to them uh, and s explain to them how this is not three gods. Uh, Muslims believe that there are more than uh, one God in the Trinity off a verse that's in the Quran in which Allah asks Jesus, did you not say that you and Mary are gods like me? And Jesus' response is, of course I did not say that. Uh, I am a servant of Allah, and I would not speak against you. And so, based on that verse in the Quran, I hear in the Islamic world that most Muslims think Christians believe the Trinity is God, Mary, and Jesus. However, I've never met a Muslim in America that thinks that's what we believe, likely because they've met a lot of Christians and they've been under a lot of Christian influence. Uh, so to help them understand the Trinity, I actually like to just talk about how God is love. And I share that it's in Christianity alone that you get such a direct statement that God by very nature is love. In Christianity, God can by very nature be love before he creates because he exists as three persons. The Father loves the Son and the Holy Spirit and vice versa. Within Islam, Allah is one person and one God. If he is by nature love, before he creates, who is there for him to love but himself, which would make him narcissistic? And so I, I really do think that because God exists as three persons within Christianity, that's why you only see God as love as a direct statement of his nature within the Christian faith, within the Bible. Uh, I think this is also a good way to help them understand the Trinity as well because it leads to a presentation of the gospel because we know God is love because he's demonstrated that for us through his son Jesus Christ uh, giving of his life for us I'll close here and uh, pick up on part two with the next two common question and objections that we'll get when sharing the gospel with Muslims <laughs>